Hi, everybody. It's Jerry Hoffman, and uh, I'm here with uh, Rick Buchanan. No, that's not Rick. Hey, hey, no. <laughs> Rick actually has um, the month off, and so I've asked uh, Mike Manchin to come to a tape with us. Mike uh, was a resident with uh, me at UCLA, uh, not, not contemporaneous, <laughs> but uh, Mike uh, did, uh, trained at uh, UCLA in internal medicine and um, is here to do the tape with us. He's now working across town at the rival institution, uh, USC. Yeah, but my, Welcome. In my heart, I'm still a Bruin. And I just bought my season football ticket. So. All right. To good. Good. UCLA. It's good to hear. It's good to hear. Um, <laughs> it's a little masochism there. Huh? <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, Somebody's got to. This is the August issue of uh, PCMA. Rick will be back next month, but uh, this is a slight change uh, from the usual. I'm getting to do this with... Mike, and um, anything you want to talk about before we dive into these, this month's uh, stuff? I hear you're going to Paris next week. I am going to Paris, not next week, but in three days. So, yeah, we have some articles in here about jet lag, which I read with great enthusiasm. Uh, not so much to and educate you, but so that I could try to avoid it. Um, <laughs> and yeah. we have some articles by French doctors, so you'll be really yes, sad. Yes, we are. We're primed. For, I'm primed for my trip. Yes. This is not your first trip to Paris. No, this is not. <laughs> no. <laughs> Many of them. Yeah. Actually, your dad lives in Paris. My father lives in Paris. It's my kid's second trip, um, and the first one they'll probably remember. So, it, you know, it'll be fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very jealous. Wow. Well, it's August. Although, Paris, having to so bring your kids, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> in August. It's not the optimal, but it'll be fun. Oh, we you know, when, we lived, when I lived in Paris, I, I thought uh, August was uh, sort of nice because the town is empty. Everybody leaves. It is, it is empty. But see, like, my memory is as a child and an adolescent growing up in Paris, everybody left and the bars were no fun and the clubs were no fun and they were closed. Yeah. But, yeah, no, you but know, I, I, it was I recognize I'm not going to be going to the bars and clubs with my, my and kids. And you're, al you're allowed to park on the street, you <laughs> know, true. everything is – and did you get the amnesty where all your parking tickets <laughs> oh, go oh, away? That's right. It's like fabulous. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, we're going to do the August issue and uh, I guess it's time for us to get started. Let's so roll. let's do it. Number one is about uh, femoral hernias. This is a review article in the British Medical Journal by Whalen from Glasgow. Glasgow and it's a little uh, Scottish. You have to talk in the back of your throat. I can't do it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we don't usually do a review articles, but the BMJ has been publishing a few that I, I think are, some of them are really good, and they do remind us of things that are important. I thought there was a couple of important take-home messages, messages in this. We've all, all seen many patients with hernia, and the vast majority of hernias are inguinal hernia, of course. And uh, inguinal hernias, the, the most important thing to know about them is that you don't really have to do anything about them unless you want to. Unless they're irritating the person enough. Right. So when they get really large, that tends to be a problem. Or, it, you know, some people just don't like having them. They mm -hmm. feel funny. Or, of course, if they get obstructed or strangulated, even worse. But those are rare. They don't happen very, very often. Um, femoral hernia is a very different deal. First of all, it's almost exclusively in women. There are almost none in men. But even despite that, women have many fewer femoral hernia than they do inguinal hernias. So it's an unusual thing. It also can be difficult to distinguish on physical exam. The authors point out that there's a lot of evidence that we don't do this exam very well. That's probably the most important point, honestly. <laughs> well, it's an important one. Um, but even if you do it really carefully, it can be hard to tell. They tend to be more lateral. They're below the inguinal ligament, although they can move around, which is part of the reason that they can be hard to diagnose. But the really critical thing about them is that they're very different in their behavior than inguinal hernias in that they are much, much more likely to get into trouble, to get obstruction to, or to even strangulate. And this is really important because with inguinal hernias, A, it doesn't happen very often, and B, you usually can go in and fix it. It's not the end of the world. With these guys, it happens a lot. Almost a, a, a substantial minority of them will go on to have a terrible outcome. Or something like almost a third, to yeah. be, you know, sort of in the... And when they do... Um, Emergency surgery leads to much, much worse outcomes than elective surgery. So for inguinal hernias, the most common thing, the appropriate thing is to have shared decision-making. If they want to have a, a referral for surgery, they can have that. They can decide to wait and watch or whatever. For And we're not talking, of course, about the one that's acutely already peritonitic. But for femoral hernias, if you think that's what it is, they need referral. They don't need emergent referral, but they need urgent referral because a lot of them that go on to decompensate do it in the next 
couple of months. So you have some time, but you don't have endless time. They should be referred, and they should be fixed before they get into trouble. Absolutely. If you're seeing a patient with a suspected femoral hernia in your office, or even with you know un unexplainable groin pain in a, a woman that fits the, the bill, otherwise difficult to examine or otherwise, it is probably worth doing a more aggressive workup, um, not emergency workup, but a more aggressive workup than the watchful waiting. An ultrasound, they suggest, is an appropriate first test uh, that was able to identify and differentiate between inguinal and femorals, and then refer those patients to surgery without much watchful and waiting, I, probably. I suspect there are some of us who are pretty good at this and remember this a lot. I was pretty bad at you know remembering, oh, yeah, that was medical school, but I don't remember this very well. And what's a spagalian hernia? Yeah, spaghetti hernia. Is, yeah. um, you know, um, even if some people will be able to manage this, you you will manage it yourself. But, but for the rest of us, it's perfectly reasonable to do early referral mm -hmm. if you're concerned about it. And as a very different than inguinal hernia. Okay, Absolutely. number two. Number two is initial coronary stent implantation uh, with medical therapy versus medical therapy alone for stable coronary artery disease by Stergiopoulos uh, in Archives of Internal Medicine. He's in the he's in the um, in the Epe, isn't he? Stergiopoulos <laughs> on the on the Olympics, right? Stergiopoulos is <laughs> is that right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the Olympics. It's, 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 there's only like three Greek athletes. <laughs> by the time you are hearing this, the Olympics will be It'll long be over. over. But now they're doing it will so, have come in fourth, so, so you'll have no I was, idea. I apologize for a bad joke. And he isn't even Greek. Well, he is Greek, but it's from Stony Brook. Uh, it's from Stony Brook, but he's Greek nonetheless. <laughs> you can't shed that. Um, anyway, so this is a, an attempt to look at whether um, PCI – with medical therapy, modern medical therapy, ACE inhibitors, antiplatelet uh, um, agents, um, is as effective or more effective or less effective than P than PCI for the management of people with stable coronary disease, not unstable coronary I, disease. I think you misspoke. Did so I? You said, Sorry. Yeah, so what we're talking about is medical therapy alone. Versus PCI plus medical therapy. Right. Sorry if I misspoke. Um, so this is a, a meta-analysis. This is... Um, the, the authors here were looking at those things. They were looking at outcomes that we all care about, death, um, even angina and the need for revascularization. They found eight randomized control t trials involving 7,300 patients um, that were followed for an average amount of time of four years. And what did the, what did the was the summary of all of these analyses? No difference. Patients who have stable coronary artery disease had the same mortality whether they were managed medically, like we all prescribe prescriptions for, versus with PCI plus medication. The PCI seemed to have no additive effect. Well, surely it must have improved their symptoms. No, same amount of angina, same need for subsequent um, revascularization, either through PCI or cabbage. So, so pretty resoundingly negative study. So the oculostent reflexes. Oh yes, I didn't mention the oculostent reflexes. Good. Right, you know this is this is something that we started that you know my cardiology attendings you know 15 years ago would talk about the oculostent reflex. You if see you, it. You see you the lesion. Stent it. You should stent it. And, you know, and that happened to the point of us now doing 400,000 of these procedures a year with very limited um, So it's benefit. not to say that there, there aren't places to do this. There are certain uh, angiographic findings that are important, unlike most of them. Lesions by themselves should be left alone unless you have a reason. And there are some people who fail medical therapy and should go on, although it's not although clear it's not that clear they, they do better. better. But, but, but at certainly, least it's a reasonable option in those patients. What this really... Um, says is that we shouldn't be doing all those angiograms because if we, if the stent doesn't add anything, mm -hmm. um, we should be treating people with optimal medical therapy and then and only if it's not working out or you or they're acute and you have a reason to believe something else is going on, that's the only place where you should be looking to see what is what is it that I have to fix. Um, it's and this really shouldn't come as much of a surprise, no. right? I mean, we know that it's the small plaques that ultimately cause the problems downstream, right. that so rupture and cause the death in MI, even and these in the big acute stable ones. Yeah, that's yeah. A, that's a really good point. I often make the the comment that even in the acute circumstance, we misinterpret all the tests we do because we do all these treadmills, and then we do the treadmill to decide to do an angiogram or a CA, a, you know, a, a CT angiogram, and we don't know what we're doing because, in fact, what we're looking for is size of lesion, and size of lesion almost never matters. Yep. Unless it's a 99% lesion or it's a proximal LAD lesion, it's not useful. In fact, as you point out, it's almost inverse. Mm -hmm. You're more likely to have an acute event if you have a smaller lesion. If you have no lesion, you're fine. Mm -hmm. But 
very few 50-year-olds have no lesion. And once you have a lesion, if you have an 80% lesion, it's probably been there a long time. You've got collateral flow. You've got <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a vulnerable plaque. Mm -hmm. So um, just to put this in perspective, it's not really that important. It's only $150 million a day that we spend on this in the United States. Yeah, if they would just give us like a couple percent of that back, <laughs> then we could stop. I bet people would stop doing this. The vast majority are worthless. Right, and remember that uh, for our Canadian listeners, kudos to you because you do 50% less uh, PCIs for angina. Which is still and, probably way too many. Which is still probably too many, but with no, you know, no discernible no measurable. health out outcome differences. Yeah. So. Yeah, really a, pre a very negative study suggesting important that, study. Yeah, suggesting, as many of the RCTs did, that stent is not superior to medical therapy. Yeah, crazy. At least start with the other. Yeah. Number three, uh, uh, cardiovascular biomarkers in observational studies versus randomized trials. This is one of several we have which will, where we'll be talking about methodology, and I think, uh, you know, I tend to love these. I apologize. I picked more of them. This is uh, by Tsoulaki and also uh, John Ioannidis, whom I've uh, mentioned many, many times. And who is Greek. And, and who's <laughs> Greek, but he says he's from Stanford, whereas Dr. Mr. <laughs> Dr. Tsoulaki only says um, Greece. Yeah, so the, the Ioannidis, I've, I've uh, pushed many times, his great That's papers. Great. And I will remind everyone again that if you haven't yet uh, read the article in the Atlantic a couple of years ago by Friedman about Ioannidis and his thinking is a fabulous article. You should read it. And if you really can't find it yourself because you're really incompetent at the web, I will send you a PDF if you ask me. Anyway, um, this looks at observational studies versus randomized trials. And uh, they looked at 31 meta-analyses of seven different biomarkers these are troponins, BNPs, LDL, CRP. So they're not just um, markers of MI that we usually talk about. These are all where they were looked at in observational studies versus in randomized trials. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The effect size for whatever they were looking at was always greater, 100% times greater in the observational studies than the randomized trials. In five out of the seven, it was more than 50% greater. Mm -hmm. So more than doubled the effect that you thought you saw. And it accounts for 25% at least of the overall reported utility of the biomarker. Now, I would point out that there, we did a study last month I think it was last month or two months ago, which showed that there are very few randomized trials of any diagnostic test. Right. And for the most part, these show that the diagnostic test is neither diagnostically nor management-wise useful, for the most part. There are certainly tests that are really useful, but we don't need to do studies to find that out. We know that an LP helps you if you're looking for meningitis. You don't have to do a randomized trial. Um, as in most things in life, the the things that are really important, it's obvious. You don't have to do the the parachute, the parachute study <laughs> from the helicopter. Right. Should you jump out of with a parachute right. or not? Um, but um, the ones where we make up things because it's some great new marker, they almost invariably are wrong. But it, this is not so much about that. It's merely the fact that if you don't do it in a randomized fashion, you're going to way overestimate the effect. Right, and they, they also highlight just some of the, the, the recurrent themes that Dr. Yanides has highlighted many times, but observational studies are so subject to selection bias. This is the driver, selection bias, confounding publication bias, um, and then the characteristic of the type of patients that are enrolled in RCTs versus observational studies, yeah, all coming together right. to reduce the effectiveness. And of we're going to talk a little bit later in a different study about the notions of reverse causality, where you see an association, but it's not because A caused B, it's because B caused A. So um, we'll get we'll we've Just talked another, about this many 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 times. Another good study mm -hmm. from that same group. Okay. Number four is yours. Number four is impact of carotid plaque screening on smoking cessation and other cardiovascular risk factors in archives of internal medicine. Um, this is a Swiss study, and the concept here is that um, getting screening may be a te teachable moment. You go to get a carot your carotid ultrasound. Okay, to look it at you. it's no good. It doesn't work for what it's supposed to work. But, at, but at maybe least. it'll quit your. It'll make you quit smoking. There you go. Yeah. So anyway, so they randomized 536 Swiss people who were all motivated to quit smoking, and they ran they randomized them to a smoking cessation program, 
which was pretty aggressive with nic nicotine replacement, a good one, you know, individual counseling, nicotine replacement, et cetera, plus carotid screening. And those that had carotid screening, if you had a plaque, they showed the nasty, waxy plaque. They showed it to you and tried to scare you, you know, like in, in old high school health class when they showed you the black lung from, from smoking. It's sort of, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very similar to that. Yeah. And they, their outcome of interest was whether or not these people quit smoking. In fact, they had really, really good quit rates. The problem was that there was no difference between the carotid ultrasound and not. 25% of the people quit at 12 months, biochemically confirmed, which is very good quit rate. Um, for fit, and These were serious smokers. These were people who'd been smoking for 30 years on average. So th they had a but great quit rate. But with most interventions, you're, you're, you're at least 15% yeah, will so, do it. But it, goes down, it goes down over time. But yeah. at a year, it was 25%. 20, pretty good. Pretty good. Wor worth doing all the other things, not worth adding the carotid ultrasound. It did nothing. The group that got the carotid ultrasound, yeah. they said, thank you very much. I knew that quitting smoking was so bad. So people often use <laughs> these sort of excuses. Well, it May not that it may not work, but it'll change behavior. Mm -hmm. And it turns this is not the only study we've done, which this is the only one of this particular one. But every time we look where you use that reasoning, it turns out to be wrong. And you can imagine that um, this didn't even help in the ones Who where they showed them the disease. What about all those where it's going to change behavior for the worse when they? Don't have a lesion. Yeah. Oh, like, well, oh, I'm doing great. <laughs> <laughs> I've been smoking for 20 years and I don't have a lesion. Why should I? I'm, forget this quit program. I'm just going to go continue to smoke. It was interesting. The uh, the authors did cite one thing in the in their literature review that did improve um, quit rates. That was telling patients their lung age. And I think this is the 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 old. You and I've talked about yes, this. I, we did. I did this all the time. Where uh, I go to a patient, I know they're a smoker. I listen. You can to their smell lungs. it and see the I don't, yellow. I don't even have to listen you know you, that, we, we all know that the stethoscope <laughs> really we don't really use that much yeah. so you go and you go like oh, are you a smoker how long have you been smoking <laughs> yeah, you do the whole thing how old are you you're oh, 52 and, and, and how long have you been smoking some... yeah, yeah you're lung, you got lungs of an 86 year old <laughs> it's like you can tell i'm a smoker <laughs> they yes they it has nothing to do with the stethoscope they do become insensate to the smell you know so it's true uh, anyway so a study that you know says yeah. yes for for trying to get people to quit no for using a carotid yeah. ultrasound to yeah. do it and you know, the bigger message is that motivation is not as simple as we think yeah Number five is about is another review article from the BMJ in the same series from Lester by Dr. Goundry. It's on the diagnosis and management of Raynaud's. I'm sure we all know a lot about Raynaud's, but this is a nice, uh, concise summary, and I thought it was a good one, so I, I thought we should include it in the database. It, they point out that it is a poorly understood episodic vasospasm in the extremities, typically hands, but also feet, mostly in response to cold, but has lots of other stimuli, including emotional stimuli. About 10% of the time, it has an identifiable immunologic cause like lupus or rheumatoid disease, et cetera. But that means 90% of the time it isn't. It's pretty common. It occurs in you know up to 20% of women, I think, something like yeah, that. Yeah, 5% of men, 10 to 20% of women. A lot. Yeah. But it's not that uncommon. You know, in the population, we all know people who have it. I have yeah. it. A lot of people have it. Lots and there's a whole patients. range from severe and not. When I used to live in New York, it was much worse because it was always cold. Mm -hmm. Here, it's... Um, not so bad, although my wife, Annie, will, will disagree when I get into bed at night. She, she says I touch her with my toes, and yeah. she's like, wah! <laughs> but anyway, maybe that has cold nothing hands, to do with the cold. Hearts. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe a, re a response to me. I don't know. It's hard to say. But anyway, um, so it's, it's not that uncommon, but 90% of the time it is not from one of these uh, immunologic diseases, which means that don't go searching for it in just about everybody. In terms of treatment, uh, calcium blockers have been shown to have some effect, as have topical nitrates. So in people who are really um, symptomatic, it's something to consider. Surgery the has- effects are modest, but- Yeah, but at least it's something. Mm -hmm. Surgery is essentially not, um, essentially no utility at all. So whom should you refer for specialist care or consideration of other things, or even for a, a bigger workup? You're not sure about the diagnosis. You think this might be immunological. There are other things that are making you know joint disease or rash or whatever. Um, they say work-related. I'm not sure exactly why, but maybe. It's a child. They say under 12 years old. Again, I don't quite understand that. Digital ulcerations. Yeah, those are those are really painful and um, poorly controlled symptoms. 
So a nice review. Just uh, yeah, everybody just, you know, to beat the smoking thing, they say smoking cessation also smoking, helps. Yeah, smoking. And um, and then avoiding stimulants. You know, caffeine. And, so I was talking and, and last night. I, so I don't mainline meth if you have <laughs> <laughs> Raynaud's <laughs> phenomena. Hmm. I, I, That's the only I planning, adverse effect. I was planning meth. on doing it this weekend, and yeah. now I can't. Yeah. I, well, you know. Okay. You're the one who said you had right now. <laughs> okay, God, what a party pooper. Yeah. Um, I was talking, I had dinner last night with somebody. And we were talking about um, how is it that healthcare in Japan is not very good, which I, I think it's not very I worked there for a while. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they all smoke, mm-hmm. which is by far overwhelmingly the worst, most important risk factor in the United States. And they live to be 20 200, times, 200, 257 years old. And they all smoke like crazy. So in America, <laughs> stop smoking. That's really uh, for everything. We don't have to keep saying it's it. A, stop smoking. But in Japan, it doesn't matter. It was matter. remarkable, you know, the images after the, that devastating tsunami from about a year ago now that, you know, they'd show these images of these little fishing villages that were decimated and they'd interview the people. And it's like a 90-year-old man <laughs> who's on, who operates a single-person skiff fishing <laughs> while only, he's chain-smoking. He's, he's cut down to six days a week. <laughs> and he's like, yes, the fish, you know, this is going to be very difficult for me to reel in the big tuna. <laughs> what is going on in this society? Anyway, um, so anyway, I, I guess part of it. health and health care are not a little the same bit different. Thing, yeah. yep. Okay, number six, bedtime antihypertensives in chronic kidney disease. This is bizarre and fascinating. It's by Ermida from Spain. Bizarrinating. It's in the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology. Um, it's fascinating because if it's true, it's really important. It's so good that I... Yeah, if the, the, the operative word was if. Well, you know, so let <laughs> we'll me... We'll go t- with what it shows. Let but. me tell you what it is. So th- these were 660 patients with chronic kidney disease and hypertension who were randomized in an open-label fashion. We're going to talk repeatedly about blinding and how important it is, but it shouldn't be everything. I mean, it affects your results, but these results are remarkable. Anyway, they were randomized open to take all of their hypertensive medicines in the morning when they got up or to take at least one of their medicines at night instead. Right, and all in the morning is a pretty standard. Yeah, and this didn't say take them all at night. It just said at least one of them. They followed them for over five years. Again, a pretty good sample, 600 patients, all complicated, kidney disease. Um, their blood pressures stayed about the same. The amount of medicine they took was about the same. They took the same number of medicines, the same doses, and they ended up having the same clinic blood pressures. However... The group that took at least one of their medicines at night, and they don't tell us if they took most of them or a mm-hmm. lot of them, or, I don't know, just at least one, um, had better outcomes on disease, some disease-oriented measures. That is, their, yeah, some, some, some labs and what was going on you know, when they took their blood pressure at night mm-hmm. and their ambulatory blood pressure. But not only that, they had a big effect on patient-oriented outcomes. Mm-hmm. The night group, I mean... Remarkably better in terms of vascular, CV, and renal outcomes, real outcomes, all the ones you know about. And death. Death, MI, stroke. And we're talking about hazard ratios of 0.3. That is a third as much. Mm-hmm. 8% died in the, the daytime. 4% died. I mean, that's, you know, that's a 4% absolute difference. Three times as many MIs. Three and a half times as many people went into heart failure and uh, death, as you pointed out. So um, they did a previous open label study in all types of essential hypertension where they found the same type of thing. Nobody has replicated their work, which is always gives me pause because, you you know, this seems like fabulous. Mm-hmm. How come nobody else has found it? Right. Um, I don't know. Does anybody, uh, any of the listeners who want to write us and tell us um, the truth about this or what you know, what you've done, if this were true, you could triple the effect of hypertension medicines. I would say that there are a lot to be suspicious of in this paper. So I'm very (laughs) suspicious. Even if it's only a third as good as it says, it would be really worth doing. Just take a medicine at night. Sure. But it just seems too good to be true. Yeah, I think it probably is. I think that there's certain things about the write-up and everything that make me suspicious that they're not very sophisticated investigators, frankly. Um, and uh, obviously, the results are just so good. More to come. It certainly doesn't appear to have harmful effects, and it's not outside of the manufacturer label to take things. And I at can't even times see. Day, I can't so. even see the um, the the advantage to the manufacturer. It's not like there's somebody selling something. No. 
And it's easy to take medicines at night. In fact, it's probably easier. Well, yeah. If you're as long as you you know you're as long as you don't wake up in the middle of the night and pass out um, is the only yeah. caveat. Yeah. But you know, doing one at night isn't unreasonable. Although, I, if you're expecting to have the mortality of your clinic, I think that's it's, a little bit of a stretch. It, it does <laughs> seem pretty, but it, it, dramatic. Yeah. Anyway, dramatic. Interesting. Number seven is by Vilne from Vilne. Nottingham. Yes, not in England, and it's yours. Vilne. Yes, it is progression from first symptom to I think diagnosis. I was supposed to say progression. Progress. It's yes. the progress. The Progression progress. from first symptom uh, to diagnosis in childhood brain tumors. This is European Journal of Pediatrics. So this is an article that is trying to educate us about what kids look like when they first present uh, or I'm sorry, when they first have a symptom of a CNS tumor versus what they look like a few months later when, when they're... us idiots finally make the diagnosis. When us, us idiots. And these neurosurgeons are going to educate us on that point. So, um, you know, the authors assert that this is a timely diagnosis, is, is remains really problematic, et cetera, and they sort of set up the stage. Their like, assertion is problematic. We don't know that diagnosing it earlier makes a big difference. No, they, they say that timely diagnosis remains problematic. Oh, I see. I think they're you were saying... No, their assertion... That is their assertion. It is also problematic yes, because there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that um, a delay in diagnosis makes a difference in most of these tumors. Having said that, none of us want to, you know, find a year later that some kid was vomiting and having problems that we could have diagnosed and treated earlier and maybe right. would have made some sort of diff some it, sort of outcome. It difference. sort of makes sense that a very long delay in diagnosis is not a good thing. Probably a short delay in diagnosis, not a bad thing. And here we're talking about relatively short, three months. And right. In for brain tumors in general, it, we'll get back to this later. Sure. But even in adults, they typically are not diagnosed early on. They take a few months of symptoms, particularly when it's headache is the symptom. And that's how it should be, as we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah, so they had 139 kids. They went back through their charts to see, you know, what, 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 what did they present with? What was their initial symptom? They found that, not surprisingly, the common first symptoms are very nonspecific, headache, nausea, vomiting. Um, those were the two big ones. And then as you went down the list, it started to become just a few percent of people had cranial nerve poly palsies or motor palsies or, or motor problems. But the big ones were nonspecific headache, nausea, vomiting. Right. And that was 50% of the kids. And that's their first symptom before they even sought care. So it was hard to argue that you should be ready to make a diagnosis if the kid has a motor deficit or as a cranial nerve palsy that you we're going to look pulling, at, you're going to yeah. pull the trigger on that one but the vast majority <laughs> of headaches you know they, they may these kids mostly started with headache most people have a headache, don't have a brain tumor. Right. And what they found is that as they progressed, the kids typically progressed pretty rapidly over the course of three months. So the mean time to duration from first symptom, I'm sorry, mean duration from first symptom to diagnosis was about three months. And by the time they got to that diagnosis, they'd accumulated several other symptoms, including the cranial nerve palsies by this point, visual problems, the headaches hadn't were persistent, nausea, vomiting. So they had on average six symptoms at the time of diagnosis and only one when they first had any problem. So the authors sort of make the claim that, oh, you know, you've got to be really careful. I think that this is, is somewhat reassuring. This to me says that when a child comes into my office um, and has a headache, you know, I know we all know that the majority of them will be fine. We'll do a careful exam, make sure they don't have anything else. And then I'll schedule a follow up in a few weeks um, or two or four, depending on the urgency and give return precautions. And if their headaches are persistent or they're developing new symptoms, I would expect to see those in just a short period of time. And, and if it, they're not, then we're in probably in good shape. What's more, you probably would do an enormous amount of harm if you went chasing every nonspecific symptom. Yeah, you're going to get these pineal cysts and not to mention the r hazard of radiation and cost and headache. And all that stuff and the vast majority don't have anything so I don't think there's any harm in the vast majority of having a slight delay we should be aware of what the symptoms are but God forbid we were diagnosing brain tumors in the first month that would mean we're way overlooking we always are worried about sensitivity we want to miss things but there's lots of harm from being overly worried um, and being non-specific, and that's really, really a problem here. So I think this is this is pretty good. Same with adults. They, they, we did a study a few years ago which said the average time to diagnosis is almost never made in the first month, and it's uh, it's almost never made after six months after symptoms. That's how it should be. Yeah, that's right. And again, if there was some reason that you had to get it, if you could catch it, you know, and that that made all the difference, but you know, is. maybe we'd be having a different conversation. But well, that's why no we spend evidence. so much time in disease things like. 
warning leak of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Right. We spend a lot of time Makes worrying a huge about difference. it because two weeks later they could be in Dead. big trouble. Yeah, and other, or and, worse. And if we treat them, they will be fine. Right, <laughs> but this the brain tumor is still going to be there tomorrow. You don't. Have to I this. always make the argument to residents and things that you're better off not knowing for that month or two anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I have a friend recently died of uh, a glioblastoma, and um, yeah, it, it's ugly. And you're once better you off diagnose not it, once you <laughs> diagnose, not so good. It's a, a very rapid and horrible downhill spiral. Number eight uh, uh, is about concussion. It's by Chrisman in the Clinical Pediatrics. Um, they surveyed a lot of primary care physicians, over 400. There was only a 25% response rate. So they actually surveyed 1,500 and 400 responded. Um, and half of them, they also sent this, this booklet from the CDC, which told them all about concussion. And we shouldn't really talk about that. The booklet was not of much use. They learned a little something, but mostly they didn't learn anything. And But the big point that the authors make is that most of these primary care physicians who answered the questions about percussion, about concussion didn't know very much about concussion. They, um, they, they had all sorts of misinformation. I don't think that's terribly important either. I do think we do need to know something about concussion. Well, this is an everyday kind of thing. Yeah, we <laughs> see it all the time, and there's a lot. That, there are some really basic things we need to know. So we all were taught that it's, it's transient and um, there's no structural damage. That was the old textbooks. And it, neither of those is actually true. It actually lasts a while. And it often has structural damage. And it, and now as the NFL suits you know, and all these athlete things show, are showing, that there are sometimes life-threatening damages that seem to be uh, occur from multiple concussions. It's slightly different. We're not talking about athletes here or professional athletes. But what are the important things? So first of all, when you first see the person, we're worried about is it just a concussion or is it something more than that? And that doesn't mean we should be resting everybody in the ER to get CAT scans just because they um, had a concussion. And, uh, you know, I, I personally believe we should be avoiding that most of the time. Especially so, since these happen in young athletes more commonly than anybody, you know. So we should worry, you know, basically, are they neurologically normal and mental status normal when we're seeing them? And if that's the case, um, you're not going to benefit from a CT scan. I think that's the really the quick and dirty. But that doesn't mean that the patient will be fine. So one of the things we traditionally do is we give people head injury warnings, and these are usually pretty stupid. They're things like, uh, wake Johnny up every hour and see if he's irritable. Well, of course he's irritable. If he's not irritable, he's dead. <laughs> I'd be much yes. more worried if he's not irritable than if he is. So we don't want to do that. What we want to do, though, is uh, warn people, kids, parents, anybody, um, that the symptoms of a concussion are common. Three quarters of people who have a concussion will have post concussive syndrome symptoms, and many will have multiple symptoms. And the typical ones are headache, a little nausea, a little problem with Dizzy, feeling of balance, ver sort of I don't feel right. It's not quite vertigo, but it's a sense of I, I don't really know where I am in space. And, um, and often problems with memory and concentration. And kids in school will often, the, the, the teachers will be saying, What's going on? He's not acting like himself. And the parents will notice it too, and the person will notice it themselves as well. Be frustrated. And and the important thing about this is that merely by following them, and I think it's a really good idea after concussion to, to have people routinely followed in a week, in two weeks, because they're going to be really worried. No matter what you tell them on day one, they're going to go like, oh, my God. I, yes, I'm it's not a child me. too usually. You know? Yeah. I'm, so I'm their not, parents are going to be freaking out. I'm not right. You know, something's wrong here. And they don't need a CT scan. They just need somebody to go over and say, no, your neurologic exam is still normal. This is a concussion. Like I told you, this is what we expected. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't overreact to symptoms. They're expected. And at the same time, um, we should be able to provide reassurance with a decent follow-up exam. The one other thing that they spend a lot of time talking about that's worth mentioning, although I don't think it's really evidence-based, is the notion that you shouldn't go back to sporting yeah. activity. But this happens a lot. The kid comes in, they're here to get cleared to go back, or you know, they're, they want to go back and so play their sport. So all the guidelines say do not clear them until they've been free of all symptoms for at least a week. Now, obviously, professional athletes go back quicker, and the, you know, in t-ball, there's no rush to get back. And... Most of this isn't evidence-based. There is the notion that you get another concussion, it could be really bad, and it heightens the effects. That may be true. It's certainly well, I not proven. I think that you can, you can use that as a motivator to keep the kid off the gridiron for a week when you say, 
if you get a second concussion, there's a strong probability that you will it will be much worse, and, and you'll then be you'll, off miss for the a long time. you'll miss the Although season. You'll miss the season. Although I don't know that it's true. If but you need it, you can use it. Yeah, they so, should be playing football. Anyway. Or you it's could get a carotid dangerous. study and see yeah. if that yeah, yeah. will motivate Smoking them. Season. But um, uh, anyway, so. So we, right, we are supposed of, to know that they don't go back until they're really symptom free. Right. So it's it's a, a rest period. They shouldn't have any symptoms for at least a day or two, and then very slow progress of of activity. You know, it goes from light to light walking, and then you know progresses on about a daily basis. And so the minimum time to return for something like this is going to be one to two weeks, and that's the the NFL concussion protocol. And a concussion, by the way, doesn't require loss of consciousness. It's just transient neurological abnormality. Absolutely. So the person who sees stars or is like, oh, I'm a little woozy. That makes it a grade better. two concussion if, it, oh. if you have LOC. Well, I'm, I, I'm very careful about whether yeah, it's well, grade 2.7 or, or no. Well, 2.7 is very serious. Yeah. Okay. You can't go back to work for at least a day. All right. Number nine. Ah, the impact of PCR results on patient management during a viral meningitis outbreak in tropical North Queensland. This is an emergency med. Australasia, um, and this is this is basically this is telling us what we we know. Most meningitis is viral. It's very frustrating to all of us to have to deal with these viral meningitides because you know do you tap them? If it's them, bacterial, it's uh, big but, problem. You know, you, you know you know it's viral, but if you tap them, then you know you're going to find some cells and, and you're going to commit them to the hospital for. And antibiotics. we know that early on you can it, it can, can be, be a confusing, confusing picture. Uh, it's a night. We, we go through this. It's a nightmare. So you try not to tap the viral meningitis if you can. But That's if the first and most yeah. important thing. But if they're very symptomatic, you, viral meningitis can look exactly about. like bacterial. They can be very sick. They can have high fever, very stiff necks, etc. But so the you, good news is that the, the converse isn't true except early on. Bacterial meningitis right. doesn't look nothing except early on it does. But the good news but is that... But that's like a day or two. I but mean, bacterial meningitis takes two forms. The fulminant form, they're really sick. The indolent form, they may look not so bad, but then even if they get worse, there's plenty of time to get them help. Right. Um, so anyway, you, you pull the trigger and decide this person looks sick enough that I need to tap them. They get an LP. Surely it's, vi it's viral. There's 100 white cells or 50 white cells. You know, they're not all polys or something horrific. There's no, you know, they're gram stain negative. It's in between. It, yeah. Can you send, you know, can you do something that would obviate the need for them to be in the hospital for three, four days getting a antibiotics. So you get a PCR. PCR looking for the virus. If you find the virus, then you're done, you're right? Done. Well, they had an outbreak of an enterovirus, which is the most common, and they said, oh, surely we instituted this PCR program, and surely we were able to discharge people quicker. We knew, even knew what virus we were looking for. And lo and behold, it didn't make a lick of difference. Um, the length of stay was exactly the same in both groups. The amount of people getting antibiotics was the same, Even if you had a positive PCR. Even if you had a positive Hell, PCR. I'm really worried about this guy and I don't know, and it could be. He, and He comes back. He has enterovirus. Slam dunk. You don't have bacterial meningitis. Still got exactly the same treatment. Yeah, what if it's a false positive? And, well, and know. we don't know why that happened, whether it was they didn't get the PCR until it was too late. Anyway. But, but the point is that... You know, these these tests that claim that they're going to help us so much infrequently do. And we've talked about many times, I again, that it's easy to think that a test is going to do X. But when you actually study it, it very rarely does. Right. We already knew the guy had viral meningitis. Of course, we sent him home after two days. <laughs> <laughs> Number 10, suffering depression in silence. Suffering in silence. Uh, reasons for not disclosing depression in primary care. This is by um, Dr. Kravitz. Um, from UC Davis. Rich Kravitz is he's, one he's, of the co-authors. He's one of the co-authors. And so um, is Ron Epstein. Ah, uh, yeah. And anyway, so this is an article that uh, looks at, it's basically a call to screen patients for depression. They said, the, the authors note that about 16% of uh, patients overall, of people overall, experience an episode of major depression. And somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 to 6% have that within the past 12 months. So yeah, major depression yeah. is really common. I know yeah, it's, that it's may be true, but a lot of that is depends upon how you define things. I, I know. know, I know. Uh, and they also know that, note that physicians are more likely to treat if there's clues or if the patients self-identify or um, directly request treatment, no kidding. but that they infrequently do that. So this paper looked at some of the, the barriers that patients, both n not suffering from depression and those who have suffered from depression, um, it, the, the barriers that they say they have in disclosing their symptoms to their doctors. Um, and basically, they, they note that 43% of patients identified at least one barrier. And they noted that... So the that means ones... that 
More, more than, than half, half didn't. didn't. More than half didn't. Which is, they don't I know. comment. They, they, they <laughs> stay away from that. But, you know, let's just say that half the people would note a barrier. And some of the things are, I think, a little bit useful in the sense that they don't think it's the PMD's job to treat depression. Good. That's, but, you know, right. so maybe they're not job. talking to us because they think, well, you're not a psychiatrist. You don't care, you know, or whatever. Well, it's we, not your job yeah, or whatever. Exactly. And that is obviously something that we, we should can help have. them see That's that right. we're there if they need us. That's right. They, the other one is they don't want to be on meds. That actually is a good thing. Though. I love that. <laughs> They're actually, that's actually right. So the, the first one I think is wrong. They should feel comfortable to speak to us about their depressive symptoms. The fact that they don't want to be on medication shows that they're a little bit smarter than most of us. That's yeah, all because and, we like to put them on medication. And maybe we should say, well, you know, it doesn't mean you have to be on medicines. There are other ways right. to deal so with That's right. So we depression. need to, to work on that. And then there's um, many that were concerned about the confidentiality issues. Absolutely. That this work, that, and insurance issues. Issues, right. Which they have um, very good reason to be. Yeah, the ones that actually had a prior history of depression were even more concerned about the confidentiality. And they were stuff. worried about stigmatization. Sti- well. Yeah, they were very worried about stigmatization and being sent off to a psychiatrist. Also, they were worried about being sent to a psychiatrist. So first of all, most people didn't say these. And second of all, the study, I think, was done really weirdly. They called up people and they said, these are reasons why people won't tell. So Which I, one applies to you? So that, a little or a lot. <laughs> so that probably way overestimates it. Nevertheless, I agree with you. We should be aware that there are going to be some people who have yeah. barriers like these. And the more we're aware of it, you know, sometimes we can make we can help people who are depressed. But we only can if they tell us. So being aware of these things may make it easier for you. You, you get that sort of feel. We can talk to patients about, you know, I don't have to tell your insurance company and no, we don't have to put you on medicine. And yeah. yes, I am here. I can this help you even forum. though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, that part of it I like. Yeah, I agree. I think that, you know, ultimately I would actually, I think I'm with you. I would say, actually, this is better than I thought. You know, I, <laughs> people who are bothered to respond to this survey, you'd think they got nothing better today. They must be pretty depressed. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't do it. Um, but, but I do think that the take home there, of yeah. let's be a little open to the idea of talking about it with our patients. Is yeah. good. Number 11, metformin is associated with lower cancer risk. Uh, this is by Reuter in Diabetes Care from the Netherlands. Um, they linked hospital databases with pharmacy databases, two and a half million patients, and they found How that... How many people even live in Holland? That um, <laughs> two million, and some of them are counted twice. But That's the good news bad. is that they lose no one to follow up. They um, they said there was a statistical association between um, uh, less rate of cancer for a whole variety of different cancers. The people who are on metformin compared to those who are on a sulfonylurea. I, I would caution people, as always, that these associations are very tenuous, and there are many reasons why it may not be true, even though there seems to be some relationship. And I don't think it probably matters in one case or one way or another. You're certainly not going to start metformin to prevent cancer. Um, on the other hand, there, the reason I thought it was okay to do this study is metformin, because you should I be want, using metformin. I want to tell people <laughs> that you should be using metformin, not um, sulfonylureas, and uh, you know we've talked about that many times. So I like that notion. Metformin is better. I did see in the medical letter this week this bizarre thing. What do you do if metformin isn't enough? And they went through this whole thing about what your choices are. And what they meant why metformin wasn't enough was that your sugar wasn't down enough. And I was ah, thinking, like, the, me- the medical letter is, is usually pretty good. Why are they pushing sugar, this dough, this disease-oriented marker that we know is not best important? Loose. <laughs> it's not important. Yeah. You should, there's random – anyway, so I, I surprised – after metformin, that's it. You're done. You don't need to worry about the sugar unless the patient's symptomatic. Yeah. And, yeah, I agree with you completely. Metformin is the only medication we know that reduces macrovascular complications. It does anything um, good. That does anything. Basically, that does anything. Insulin does good stuff Insulin for microvascular. In type, but that's in type, type one. 1. Yeah. So, yeah, use metformin. And if your patient uh, says, I don't want to, I'd rather use a sulfonylurea, say that you won't get uh, any of 20 different cancers that they say you're less <laughs> likely to get. <laughs> Number 12 is another quickie. It's yours. No, I really want to get into this one because it's never been done before. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, this actually, is... the last time we did this was they were making the claims of the opposite. It, oh, was, it was a lie. So okay. the, at least the, we have the right one this time. Right, okay. This so is, what, uh, what are we talking about? Number 12, acu- uh, moxicillin for acute rhinosinusitis, a randomized controlled trial um, in JAMA, February of 2012, which I find just remarkable that we're still having this debate. In JAMA in February 2012, 166 patients, so not even a big trial. You get the JAMA for that nowadays? It took them three years to get 166 patients. They randomized them. Who they would were... want to be in a trial? Of course you don't. Medicines don't work. It's a <laughs> virus, for God's sake. Anyway, this is of adult patients. These are people that really had sinusitis. You know, it wasn't a cold. They had pain and fevers and all sorts of things um, that they tried to say were more consistent with sinusitis as opposed to a cold. They gave them amoxicillin versus nothing. And um, at three and ten days, there were no difference in clinical outcomes. In many, many outcomes. In many, but many outcomes. In most important was the quality of life outcome. They, they had a, a disease-specific quality of life outcome that we would normally not report on in the abstracts because we recognize how silly those things are. But th- whoever invented this one also <laughs> knew how silly they were and named it the Sinonasal Outcome Test 16. Which is also known as the snot sixteen. I love so it. you know you got to throw that in there, Kudos. give it a bone, and Kudos. it didn't, and it, it also didn't improve that. So <laughs> another negative study of antibiotics for viruses. Yeah. <laughs> Thirteen. Uh, oh, this is mine. Warfarin assessment every four weeks or every twelve weeks in people who t- seem to have a stable INR. This is by Schulman in the Annals from McMaster, and I apologize, it's yours. Yeah, no, that's okay. Mm-hmm. No difference to me. Um, so most of the guidelines say check it every – for people with stable INRs, you still need to check it every four weeks. Okay, Because we do that. Because that's what we do. <laughs> because uh, well, why would a guideline deviate from what we do? Why else was it in the Bible that way? <laughs> that's right. It's in the Constitution. So in the UK, apparently these wacky Brits uh, with their crazy sense of humor are uh, are going ahead and, and some sometimes doing this up to every three months. And so, but that's just lunacy, right? <laughs> so th- anyway, this is a this is a randomized controlled trial conducted in Canada to sort this out. And Canada's sort of half U.S., half U.K. So they were uh, truly uh, ambivalent on this on this issue, as they um, are about everything. Right. <laughs> so they don't have strong opinions in right, Canada. Right, exactly. It's, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, so they randomized people to with stable INRs. This isn't the people just started or anything like that. Stable INRs. We've to, been testing it every month for the yes, last for six, six months, yeah, and it hasn't changed. Fine. Okay. We haven't changed. It's very stable, folks. The ones that you know it's stupid to order it, but you do it anyway because you're following a guideline or your computer record flags right. for you. Um, <laughs> you know, your Q4 weeks versus Q12 weeks, 250 people. Um, they all got seen every four weeks. The, and there's that's the caveat is that everybody – well, they all got an INR drawn every four weeks, and then the INR was only disclosed to the, the doctor – if it was way out of whack. Otherwise, they reported a sham value. They just gave them somewhere in the, the normal range. And then they, you know, so they, and they telephone contacted everybody to make sure that they weren't bleeding out of their nostrils and stuff like that. Um, and what did they find? They, they found that people were, um, the, the basically nothing. They yeah, found they, nothing. All the same. The, everything was the same. No one bled to death. Nobody had any major outcomes. Um, and then if you checked at Q4 weeks, though, you were more likely to get your your med adjusted a couple of times, although of it didn't actually result in being out of the window more often. So they would tinker with it more. Um, but it, you would actually, it would cause no some reason. problems for no reason. So this seems to be some evidence. But we know, right. you know, so it raises a bigger question, which is we already know that people are out of their their uh, comfort zone a lot of the time, no matter what you do. Sure. Um, I'm wondering, you know, it is true that if you're really high for a long time, there's a risk. But does it even matter if you're high for intermittently, you go back and forth a little bit or low a little mm-hmm. bit? Um, does that have any clinical effect? I don't think we have any idea. No, I think I would agree with that. So, so anyway, a, a maybe study we're that making. Says, so, you know, one of the problems with warfarin, you know, I always talk about how it's amazing. It's such a terrible drug, and yet we haven't come across with anything better. But one of the reasons it's terrible is because you're always you're checking with the INRs, but maybe you don't have Right, the to. new class of medications, maybe they're out of the window all the time too, but we don't have a test, so we don't have to worry about <laughs> exactly. it so much. Exactly. You know, we just and, don't worry about and it. And they don't have better outcomes. No, they, they certainly don't have better outcomes. All they profess is that they're, you don't you have don't to have monitor to check it. So yeah. how about just doing a warfarin and don't and check don't it? Don't check it. Yeah, give them five milligrams and cross your fingers. Who knows? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, check it yeah. once in a while. Yeah, if they start to bleed. 14. Uh, herpes zoster vaccine in 50 to 59-year-olds, pretty young, um, by Schmader 
in uh, CID, clinical infectious diseases, multicenter study, more than 22,000 patients randomized. That's how you do it. The vaccine or placebo for a year. And the vaccine efficacy was calculated at 70%. The incidence of zoster, of clinical zoster, was 30 in one in the group that got the vaccine, 99 in the group that didn't get the vaccine. That comes out to you need to treat, vaccinate, 160 patients a year to prevent one case of zoster. Right. Now, Mark McConnell and I uh, discussed this on email before. I tended to be enthusiastic because this seems to be pretty good. And I don't, you know, I think clinical zoster, and particularly clinical post herpetic neuralgia, is a big deal. Particularly, but that only affects. But that's only a small percent at best. Of the, the people who get zoster. The, the adverse effects were very, you know, they were very common, but they were all trivial. They were mostly injection pain site, but they were three-quarters of the patient. So I guess you have to ask yourself, what's the, or maybe the patient should ask, what's the balance between 200 patients, maybe it's closer to the actual number needed to treat. Um, 200 patients, 199 get no benefit, one less case of zoster compared to Three quarters of those patients will have some mild some side redness effects. and pain, and, and you know it costs money too. Of course, they're no longer making vaccines free like they used to. They're they're no longer public health measures. They're now they're profit making centers as, mm-hmm. as with any other medicine. So this is why they're trying to push this guideline down to fifty instead of sixty. So the question is, is it worth it? And I I don't know that you can say there's an answer. Maybe this is a place for shared decision making. I don't know. I, I'm less enthusiastic. It seems like an awful lot of people for a disease that doesn't. Do that much, and I get it. People get rare. People get postherpetic neuralgia. We don't even have any. Well, data but zoster on that. itself is very unpleasant. Uh, you know, it's only and a week it, or two. Of well, symptoms. but all well, these people with their injection sites had. And you know, in many. young people, it tends to be even more unpleasant. Although they tend to get less postherpetic neuralgia and unstudied. <laughs> so uh, you know, I don't know. I, I there is a small benefit. Uh, it's not a terribly harmful vaccine, but the benefit is relatively small, and there's a lot of lot of minor side effects. I don't have to worry about it because I'm not 50 yet. <laughs> and I don't have to worry about it because I'm long past 50. <laughs> You're already in the mandatory group, Gary. They're going to be coming around here with their public health wagon. Well, I was, th- you know, I was, you. I was thinking that it was a good idea, although, of course, I haven't done it. Yeah. But... Um, but when I let, said that on the tapes, Mark McConnell, one of our listeners, um, wrote and said, really? And, um, you know, I had to admit that uh, I'm not so sure. Yeah. All right. Fifteen is yours. Yikes. Fifteen, possible net harms of breast cancer screening, updated modeling of the Forrest Report in British Medical Journal. Now, you should uh, know that we talk about this a lot on this tape. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm not surprised. Uh, everybody talks about breast breast cancer screening a lot in their practice. This is a, a big well, but also about industry. the possible harms, right? And the possible harms. So the value of mammography has long been scientifically suspect. I mean, that's not you know, uh, but it's also been politically relatively untouchable. Yes. So it's been you know, it's this horrible place to be as a doctor right. or as a as a consumer of the medical literature who c- continues to read articles that say, boy, the value is. Sm- at small at best, and although it's oh. not so vanishingly small to compare to prostate cancer, where it's a little easier to say right. just say no because there's no value and right. there's lots of harm. Here, there is a marginal value, mm-hmm. at least suspected by the studies, mm-hmm. um, but of but course we, there's potential harm. Right. Going to tell and us all right. of the in all of the studies that were sort of championed in the era of breast cancer screening ignored the harms. Of is course. basically what what this boils down to. And as people have done more trials and more reanalysis, there have been more focus on the quality of life years lost due to overdiagnosis, um, unnecessary biopsies, unnecessary mastectomies, etc. So just so, just to be clear, overdiagnosis is not the false positives. There are plenty of those. That's just it's not all the, the one out of two women who will get a scare and have to get repeat or that's a biopsy. That's a false positive. But we're talking about you have cancer under the microscope, but we know that it if we had never found it, it would never have bothered you because we know that in the population who never get screened and get to end of life, there's lots and lots of cancer. Very few people are dying of cancer. So most of the cancers don't have a clinical impact in life. Most breast cancer, just as most prostate cancers and most thyroid cancers and most 
brain cancers, right. we know that there's a lot of things where if we were looking down there, all of us every day, we'd find them, and we're much better off not knowing because they never bother us. Right. And so the, the authors here conducted a very sophisticated um, modeling of 100,000 British women. So these are fictitious British 50-year-old women and used all the different assumptions used in the original studies versus the more updated studies to say, you know, what in terms of quality-adjusted life years do you get if you screen 100,000 50-year-olds for 10 years, or uh, I think they went a little further than that, I can't remember. But um, they went that, that that way, and what they found was pretty striking. They found, oh, it was over a 20-year period, sorry. They found that in the early portion of it, the first, say, 10 years, 7 years for sure, there was net n harm to women who are screened, screened. And the reason for that is the prevalence of disease is low. They're more difficult to detect, and there's more false positives, more overdiagnosis. As, one, as they emerge from that first seven to ten years, then you start to see more quality of life year adjusted uh, benefit, and that's because more people actually have true positives and stand to benefit from the treatment. So the net effect after 20 years is very marginal benefit, maybe a thousand quality adjusted life years, depending on you know which model you use or something like that. Over 100,000 women. Over 100,000 women for 20 years. So enormous, and then at the cost of, they said, at least 10% will have false positives, maybe as many as 50%, um, with re resultant, you know, all the other junk associated with that, and um, several percent over diagnosis. And so getting chemotherapy and all this kind of stuff that you actually never would have caused a problem. So huge numbers of people to screen. And this for is 50 year old. This, this is, is 50, not This the is 40. not the 40 to 49 year old. This is the group which has the maximum benefit that right. anybody's ever claimed. Right. And so, you know, I always, I, I, I've said many times that when the U.S. Public Health Service Task Force was terribly criticized for Thank saying you. you don't have to do it in 40-year-olds. You should just talk to them. I thought they should have been criticized in just the opposite direction. They should have said the same thing for 50 years right. old. Not to say you can't do it, but that it's up to the woman. Yeah. There's very small chance that an individual woman will benefit. There's certainty that an individual woman will have some costs. Right, you'll have to go, you'll have to get your breast squished you by the You worry about it, and, you know. there's pain is common, and they're one out of two, if you do it every year for 10 years, one out of two will have a false positive. Right. And, so. and a substantial portion of them will end up having procedures and so stuff, if not they just a, oh, you need another yeah. scan, you know. Right. And if they want to do it, that's their right, but the notion that it's, it's, a, it's bad public policy to tell patients that, this should be based on shared decision making rather than saying you need to have it. That's crazy. Well, we the the next article really is segues beautifully into this, and this is yours, Jerry. Yes, this is uninformed compliance or informed choice. It's by Stefanik. I like this paper a lot from the JNCI, uh, Indiana University. It's a really nice essay um, which talks about the frequent potential harm. Very frequent versus the occasional or more likely rare potential benefit in almost all cases of cancer screening. It's probably worse for prostate, it's, but it's bad for everything. And basically, to put it into a nutshell, they say, instead of spending lots and lots and lots of time writing guidelines and making recommendations, we, medical societies, experts, should spend all that time educating the public to foster informed individual choices. In it, that's one of the biggest problems we face is we have created a monster. You know, we sometimes blame patients. Well, they want it. Well, where would they get that from? Yeah, we, why would we they know them. that they want Why would they want their breast squished in a plate? But it's also true that um, that it is a little counterintuitive, the idea that knowing something early might not be useful. It might actually be harmful to you. How could it hurt? It's just information. Well, all information isn't good. If you don't know what to do with the information or you are misled by it or you end up harming people because of it, you know, it might be that doing it saves one person's life out of 100. But if it kills two other people and you don't know which is which, yeah, if you're the one who, who gets saved, you'd want it. But if you're the one who gets killed, you don't want it. So, um, so I think this, it's a beautifully written editorial. And again, it says we should be spending our time revising the public myths about screening so that people can get information and make informed choices rather than writing these silly guidelines. Right, and the other thing that I really enjoyed about the paper was that it really talked about using not numbers screened as our metric for success, um, 
but the number informed, the number educated. And I think that that's really nice for a lot of reasons. One is I think that's correct, but also I think that it starts to make us think a little bit differently about our role as a physician as opposed to that you do this because, you know, and he, I think he, in this article or another, called it a summons you know you, you get a summons to get your mammography or your this or and, that or, and you were telling me your wife just my did, wife she just got her magic... she, she hit the the magic 40 so she, she doesn't listen so she won't she won't care <laughs> to this you won't let her <laughs> i won't let her that's for sure but um you know so she got this summons and she's not a physician she's like oh she but was we ready also, to make a, an appointment and but i said the, why don't you take a look at this <laughs> but the point we that you're making is that we're also graded on this we get yeah. mocked off yeah if the patient didn't get the screen we should get marked off that the patient didn't get informed. Are these health plans, that's their metrics that they report. 90% of our people got screened. Well, there's no, you maybe know, there that's may not be no, good. Right. And certainly it doesn't imply that 90% of the people wanted it. So what you'd really want is metric, that, you know, we, we, we talk to 90% right. of our patients. And then these advocacy, advocacy groups shouldn't fight right. over the, whether it's 42 year olds that should get it or 50 year olds or whatever. But was the president informed? Was, and how to best create documents and, and informational material that can help a doctor talk to a patient in various languages with various cultural values, et cetera. That's a good use of those people's time. Yeah. So a really nice essay, those of you interested. Mm -hmm. 17 is a quickie. Therapeutic ultrasound is not beneficial in ankle sprains by Swain, British Bur Journal of Sports Medicine from Sydney in Australia. Um, and I so told you the answer already. It's yeah, not beneficial. It's right, no, this is the this definitely is the Rick nine Ricotta studies of the uh, you know title of the month. Uh, nine studies, six hundred six patients, not so good quality. So we don't really know the answer, but the best but we you'd can expect tell is them to sham be ultrasound is just as good yeah. as real ultrasound, and nothing is just as good as sham ultrasound. <laughs> So it's it doesn't mean. work. Yeah, I, I wish that, you know, there, I had a therapeutic ultrasound when I had a, a knee reconstruction, and they put that thing on. It's not like a diagnostic ultrasound. It hurts. Like, it does something to your tissue. It does. It does. It, it and, does and, but it isn't good. No, no, it hurts. It doesn't help. <laughs> and I'm not happy. Well, maybe that. that's the way it does help is that you, you, you see, when they stop so it. They yeah. stop it. It's like, thank God they stopped. I often think that. All right. Um, another 18. quickie. This is a randomized controlled trial. This is number 18. Randomized controlled trial of short-term efficacy of in-shoe foot orthosis compared with a wait-and-see policy for anterior knee pain and the role of foot mobility. So that's uh, the uh, This patella is patellofemoral syndrome. Yeah. So the, 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 the model goes that the, the foot excessively pronates. That causes your vastus muscles to pull your patella laterally, which results in this patellofemoral syndrome. And that by... The young some, athletes. Yeah, yes, yes, typically in athletes, although in this one they were a little bit older, but yeah, they were still pretty young. So the the theory here is that if you can get the foot to, to like move back into its – be less pigeon-toed, um, that the yeah, that'll – Pigeon-toed. Pigeon-toed, yeah. that you will uh, have less – Strain. Strain, et cetera, and so this must be a good idea. So they did a randomized controlled trial. It was a single-blind trial. 40 patients with a six-week outcome of did you feel better or not as their primary outcome. And then they also had something called the Kujala patellofemoral score. I know that I frequently chart the Kujala patellofemoral score on I'm, my patients. I, I, we're, in my group, we're, we're uh, graded. We're by. graded on I screen for <laughs> based on Kujala patellofemoral score. Anyway, they report dramatic differences with these these insoles. So, you know, you put a little piece of plastic in your foot and everybody gets cured. So 50% of the people with the orthotics or orthosis uh, group got uh, were reported near total improvement and only 5% in the other group. So huge, huge treatment effect. The curious finding is that the you know, this was a global score. Like, do you feel better, yes or no? And they and know they have the thing stuck yeah. in their shoe. After I helped you, was it yes. was it helpful? Right. Um, versus this thing that's supposed to specifically measure your no patellar femoral pain and, and limited mobility and all that kind of stuff, this Kajula patellofemoral score, and there was no difference there. So yeah, this and then when you actually look at the things that we can have some idea of whether it mattered, like the visual analog score, yeah, the differences minimal, are very small. Very minimal. So it's, this, this appears to be uh, exuberant reporting of a, fairly, uh, of a minimal, at best, effect of shoe arthrosis. Good. I like it. I got one in. I got two in right now. <laughs> Number 19. Prophylactically. Uh, randomized trial of yoga, stretching, and self-care for chronic low back pain. Guess what this shows? Like every other study that's ever been done. Sherman, Archives of Internal Medicine, 226 patients, chronic low back pain, 12 weeks, it classes of yoga, stretching, or just here's a booklet, go do whatever you want. 
Uh, no difference at six weeks, 12 weeks, or six months between the two different classes, yoga or stretching. Although they all tended to favor stretching over yoga, both were slightly better than just go off and do whatever you want. <laughs> than getting a book thrown in your face. <laughs> um, and 85% of the yoga group versus only 51% of the stretching group loved it, said, yeah. I would definitely recommend this class. So what, is it, what does this really tell us? We know that none of these things really affect outcome. There have been so, hundreds of trials. Of so I think what it says things. is that paying attention to the patient helps. Yeah. So uh, the self-care booklet didn't do any worse. It's just that no. um, they felt better when you paid attention. It didn't they matter what you did. They knew when you gave them a booklet saying, here's how you fix low back pain, that you were saying, please leave my office. And, and there's the, also something magical about things that are magical. So yoga, was they liked it much better even though it was slightly worse in all the outcomes. Right. I, I for one, uh, am a sufferer of chronic back pain, and I can tell you that I enjoy stretching. It gives me something to do, and it gives me a feeling of control over my process. Truthfully, I, if, I'm, I like just, if I'm dispassionate about it, I know that you know six months ago, I'm, it still feels exactly the same as it did then, but, but sometimes hey, I go through a couple of weeks, and, hey. and I stretch the heck out of it, and I feel real good about me being proactive, and I think that that's what we're measuring with most of these whereas, studies. Whereas... It, now you get a couple of weeks out of every every six months. A couple of weeks are really good with the stretching. Whereas if you didn't stretch, you'd only be good two weeks out of six months. <laughs> the rest of the time, you'd be, I'd be terrible. I'd be, I'd be out. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, crushing. Yes, twenty. Number twenty. This is crushing or splitting medication. Unrecognized hazards. Well, because who would who? Uh, you, no, I, but, uh, just, I know. So on. this is a review article about the inadvisability or dangers of crush, uh, splitting or crushing medication. So why do people split? Yeah. Or crush? So I think that uh, I'm glad you asked that because I, when I'm sitting here looking at this article, I find that this is a health policy article more than anything else. Um, even though it, it's not really billed as a health policy article, so older individuals tend to. Sp split and crush medications more. Why? Because we over, first of all, we give them way too many medications. And then because of our screwy pharmaceutical benefits in this country, we get them into the, the proverbial donut hole where they have to pay for all of their between $2,000 and $5,000 or whatever it is, uh, amount of, of medications out of their own pockets. So they try to skimp on it. And pharmacies... And not are, just old people. Everybody's yeah, got to skimp on I know, on but medicines. they have a lot yes, of medications. It gets them into that hole and all that kind right, of right. stuff. But yes, all people people, but particularly the elderly who are on so many medications. So mostly people do it for cost. reasons of cost, although there is probably also true that we, you know, as, as several people have pointed out, we probably start out at much too high doses. Many people have side effects of medicine. They're smart enough to know, well, maybe I'll cut it in half. Yeah, that's true too. And then some people legitimately have problems swallowing, hence the crushing yes. business. So anyway... Um, so, so this article is looking at, you know, is this advisable and, and, and such? Oh, the other thing is that pills, um, just for whatever reason, the market has suggested that we price them by the pill, not by the milligrams. So you get a discount by buying 40 milligrams of low And taking 20 at a time. That's right. And so that is another re – that's a very rational economic argument for yeah, it. Absolutely. And, and so, you know, it's, it's understandable. It's not, a it's not a rational argument for the way they're priced. No, it's it, a rational it argument for taking it. shows how stupid it is, but yeah. it's a rational argument for doing it. So if you're the drug company and you want to make twice as much and you don't want them to, to – get it cheaper by buying a bigger pill and splitting it, you make it harder to harder split. To, you don't, so you score, don't score it. it on both sides and et cetera. So anyway, the articles note that lots of, you know, the elderly people are doing this um, and that it, that's particularly problematic in the elderly because they are difficult to break. Pills and may be difficult. And they're saying, you know, they're breaking them in on their, on their table, their, their counter edge. Um, they're rarely using pill splitters. They're rarely involving pharmacists in this process and that that should probably change. My take home from this is that most pills can be split. There are good ways of doing it and bad ways of doing it. Good ways include getting a good pill splitter and asking the pharmacist whether, one, this is an appropriate pill to split. So extended relief things, um, extend, you know, XR, uh, all that kind of release, I should say, not relief. Those kinds of pills invariably are not okay to split or crush. Well, probably not invariably, well, but mostly. Mostly. It, at least many of them, they ha they're, they're something in the coating that helps right. you release it slowly, and if you get rid if of you it. crush it or yeah. something like that, then it doesn't work. So asking the pharmacist if it's appropriate, getting their help to actually split the medication. And there are actually a couple of medicines where the inside is actually toxic, where you, you right. can't put it on your skin, the, like Selcept. Uh, Selcept is like that. Dabigatran has, oh, no, that's a, a, a finasteride. Problem. Um, yes. Proscar. 
Postcard yeah. is another one. Yeah, so you can't do it. So there are some caveats here. Uh, the lists of medications that are appropriate or inappropriate is way too long to go over on this tape. But I think the point is that know that your patients are likely going to be doing this. It Talk is, to them about it. Talk to them, them about it. Talk, involve the pharmacist. That is their job. And I know? agree with you. It oh. shouldn't be that you don't do it. It's just that you have to know there are some caveats. Yeah. I think the bigger message is we should all be outraged at the way our healthcare system charges right. people, and and um, you know we should all be involved in, in, in trying to change that. Number twenty-one variation in pre-op medical consultation. It's a nice study by Vijay Sundara from Anesthesiology at the University of Toronto. They use a big administrative database in the province this of is a of, good study of Ontario. More than two hundred thousand major elective non-cardiac surgeries over a five-year period in the ending in two thousand and nine. And they found that preoperative medical consults for these non-cardiac surgeries that were elective done in 38% of the patients. But there was huge variation from hospital to hospital. As in America, where they've shown geography matters. Right. This is really a Canadian extension of, you know, Wenberg's small area variation. Yeah, this is yeah. what, what, which hospital you're in. Some hospitals did 6% of them. Some did 80%. Mm -hmm. So huge, huge variation. Uh, for the same surgery, same patient uh, factors, surgery level factors and patient level factors explain 6% of the variation. Hospital side explains more than 30% of the variation. So this is, and this is non. You know, lest we get confused, this is these are serious operations. So this is very. These it, are. You know, it doesn't tell us what's the right number, but right. it tells us that we're not choosing based on anything rational, mm -hmm. and um, it's very impressive the way in which we tend to be sheep. We do if what our what the people around us do. Mm -hmm. It's, it's yep. really, really, and they did actually go the extra mile in this case uh, to look at outcomes based on uh, the preoperative consultation. Like, did it have anything to do? And and the the answer was largely no. The group that had the highest preop um, rate, the hospitals that had the highest preop consultation rate, also had the highest mortality. Now, there's obviously a lot of yeah. I, I didn't go into that yeah. because this is you can't really even... I know but it was it, at least they there wasn't evidence that it was useful that, that's right they did not find evidence that this was actually helping people okay. 22 oh managing motion sickness by Merton et al British Medical Journal um, again number 22 so this is a review of the management of motion sickness um, so I learned a very interesting fact in this paper which is that nausea the word nausea comes from the Greek word vask obviously <laughs> that means ship <laughs> which is what, so nausea actually means Lance sort of motion, motion sickness. sickness and it's um anyway they so this may come up on occasion especially for someone on their way to vacation or something like that and they also highlighted a new motion sickness danger lurking out there for the younger patients which is cyber motion sickness kids that are in front of like 60 inch screens where the 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 jet that they're playing is moving around in space so this causes it's caused by some mis mix match of sensory um, inputs versus visual inputs etc um, I think we all understand that bit um, it's very very common there's a toxin hypothesis there's all sorts of funny things you don't like the toxin hypothesis toxin hypothesis is that we get sick and vomit because it's it's a response to us eating a neuro uh, toxin. And so we eat it, we start to feel like diplopia or something like that, and we throw up to say, stay alive. That's, you know, obviously something that's not proven, but it was kind of a cute little thing. So what did they say? They said that, you know, the diagnosis here is not usually a problem. The therapy is problematic on occasion. Um, most of the time it's self-limited. Um, until you get off the boat, uh, or when you get off the boat, it ends. But there are certain behaviors one can do if the patient's particularly susceptible or particularly suffering. And those include having them have a fixed visual reference, so you focus on something instead of like sort of just gazing around. Um, it's better to lie down so than, we can, than we sit can up. tell people these things. Yeah, you can tell. This is stuff you can and tell people. And you can do people. it yourself. Yeah. Uh -huh. Forward visibility, so focus on something in front of you, avoid excessive head turning, regular breathing and music. I don't think this is earth shattering if you're ever on a cruise ship you everybody, know, knows. everybody all the guys who are sitting there pro you know supine etc with mute listening to music and closing their eyes are, are doing all of these things um but you know it's still interesting in terms of drugs they said that um scopolamine or hyoscyanin hyacin is the the one that seems to have the best 
profile. It makes you a little sleepy, gives you dry mouth, etc. Um, the other antihistamines have pretty poor results in the um, in the trials, including Dramamine, which I was surprised that they they were pretty negative on Dramamine. They they were really all for scopolamine. They they mocked acupressure bands, those things that people put around their wrists that are supposed to make them do this. Um, and then they said that other things are... Sort of like are, stretching. Yeah, they said that other things are, you know, <laughs> plus minus, things like triptans yeah. and stimulants. So the big one was, was scopolamine. It's scopolamine. And then I think probably most important is the, the, the behavioral things that you right. can do. Number 23, another uh, paper that I think most of our listeners will be really, really... Uh, fascinated by. The United States spends ah, yes. four times more than Canada interacting with payers. This is in Health Affairs. It's by somebody named Mora, and I think it's a really excellent paper. 70% survey response uh, from 216 doctors and administrators in Ontario compared it to a companion survey in the U.S. Now, when I say excellent, I don't mean that the methodology is excellent, but I th the point is really important. This is one of these economist papers. Yeah. It's a little bit messy, big data, et cetera. It's so they asked people, you know, how much time do you spend, how much time do your spa staff spend, et cetera, and they were only looking with dealing with insurance. Now, in the United States, we have 7 billion insurances or not, as opposed to there's one person you go to, and that's what you deal with, and they have the same forms and the same everything and that's all you deal with and so in ontario the each practice spends twenty two thousand dollars on this in a year when you add up the doctor time the nurse time the 000. clerk time in the united states eighty three thousand almost four times as much we work harder um even worse our staff and nurses in the united states spend 21 hours a week on dealing with payers which is 10 times more than in Ontario, 10 times mm -hmm. more. Um, so what do they recommend? They say we should have standards for interaction, electronic interaction, a single credentialing process, automated point of care verification of patient eligibility for insurance benefits would help. Um, I, I know what you're going to say. Yeah, I think <laughs> there's a better solution. <laughs> well, you can accomplish all of those things by having a single pair. Just have <laughs> a single pair. I mean, Good luck, this Jerry. Is, you know, amongst <laughs> the many reasons why. So I like this because I think a single pair is the only thing that's not obscene and that this is we have an incredibly unethical health care system. Um, and I know that some of you disagree with me and some of you agree with me completely and we're probably never going to agree. But one thing we can agree on that is really crazy for us to be spending all this time and money having to deal with insurance companies. And one huge advantage of not ha of having a single payer is that it cuts it in the one, it cuts the dollars in a quarter and the time in ten. Right, and the free marketers there, they, they you know, this is health affairs. They're usually kind of free market types. Um, they, they said that, you know, maybe there's something gained by this. We do less waste or anything like that. But all other uh, evidence suggests quite the opposite. And what's so. more, this is Canada. It's not England. This is right. a this is a for profit healthcare system. It's a fee for service healthcare mm -hmm. system. Is this just about how much time you have to spend to try to get your money? And this is just us. You and know, this isn't even what the patients have. Well that's to. what I was gonna say. Because this is just us as doctors, which is incredibly frustrating and we know how to speak the language. We know, ex you know, how to push through the queue. We know how to do these things. My family has had several, you know, sort of rather serious health health problems in the in the past um, year or so, and I've because I'm the doctor have to, you know, be the person who has to call these insurance companies frequently, and it is amazing. Absolutely, it is absolutely my, horrific. My, my, my mom was in the hospital recently, and a very good friend, and both of them were had the comment that every patient needs to have an advocate while you're sick and then needs to have someone figure out what to do with insurance afterwards because you need to have a doctor to do just that because yeah. it's so wacky. It is insane. And it's to the point now that if the bill is for less than $500, I, don't, I just pay it. It's not worth <laughs> the time. Even though you know that it's eligible and all these things, it's going to take 40, you know, 45 calls. It's just not worth it. It's really yeah. stunningly horrific for our patients. 24 is a neat little paper. Mm -hmm. um, even though, again, the methods are not perfect, I love the uh, it doesn't, inclusion. Yeah, this is one of those ones where it doesn't matter. <laughs> Sitting and patient perception of time. This is by Sweden in Patient Education Counseling from the University of Kansas. So we've in the past noted that uh, there is evidence that when you sit down, the patient thinks you're um, spending more time with them. 
And when you stand, they think you're spending less time with them. Now, this is probably less important in the office, but it's really important on rounds, and it's important where it's discretionary whether you're sitting or not. Well, for all the hospitalists that are. Yeah, and so um, they took a, a single neurosurgeon was going to do his first post-op visit after a back pain surgery. Why they have surgery for back That's pain, I don't know. Neither here nor but <laughs> but uh, he, his first visit afterwards, and he was told half the time you will sit and half the time you'll stand, and it's randomized which it is. He knew what the study was about, so that makes it a little screwy. And what's more, they told the patients, we want to see how well sitting affects your, your perception. So I don't know why they did that. It probably makes it even more impressive than what I'm about to tell you. But what they did was the same guy did 120 patients and he did his usual visit except half the time he sat on the bed and half the time he stood up and talked to them. And he, the <laughs> most fascinating part is how long did he spend? It's a first visit. First right? visit. The guy's just... We, he, like, we had surgery. I'm going to tell you all about it. He spent you're a minute. You're not going to be paralyzed. He right? spent a minute. A minute. Well, when he was sitting, he spent a minute. When he was standing, he spent almost a minute and a half. Yeah. It's unbelievable. But what's even better The is patients were satisfied and deluded by, by the amount of time. <laughs> they thought when he was sitting, when he was standing, and he spent a minute and a half, yeah, they seconds. thought he was three and a half. So more than doubled it, mm -hmm. three and three quarters. But when he was sitting, he only spent a minute. They thought he spent more than five minutes. Amazing. They thought, like, he's been here forever. Let's get, get, get this guy out of here. Leave. I'm tired. Let's the surgery didn't take this long. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, uh, you know, there, it's it's a little bit of a screwy study, um, right? But and but the patients it, were very; they expressed a lot of positive comments when he was sitting, and oh, not yeah. as many. So yeah, I'm a, a big thing. believer in that. You, we need to sit, and or as my friend Mel Herbert says, you walk in the room and lie down. That <laughs> will be really effective, and they'll really think. Here, well, here. you just give them the scalpel, <laughs> and <you're, laughs> then they're like thrilled. <laughs> but um, a lot of what patients perceive has to do with our behaviors and attitudes, and how we talk and how we our body language and this just makes that point all right the next paper is number 25 um jet lag and shift work sleep disorders how to help reset the internal clock this is a, a, a the mayo center for sleep medicine this is a review um, of, of jet lag and shift work sleep disorder. Shift work sleep disorder is probably mostly for, um, well, actually, no, on-call counts. So people sure. who have call, it says hospitalists, call. Yeah. Hospitalists for sure. Uh, I was going to say hospitalists, but really on-call doctors it would probably yeah. be included as long as you yeah, take call more. Gets waked up. Yeah, gets woke up all the time. Um, so they're looking at these two entities. Jet lag, we all know about. I'm going to France, as previously mentioned, um, on you, Friday. You. Bastard, yes, you bastard. <laughs> and I'm going to arrive at 8 in the morning and obviously, you know, walk oh, right, around Paris like... stunned and, you know, with my eyes burning. So they said, Here, here's what you know, what we know about jet lag. It's worse going east to west. Uh, I'm sorry. No, west no, to no, east. West to east. Going to France is going to be worse than coming home. Which because... is, no, it's, ne it's always better to go to France, but <laughs> you get more The caveat is that. That's the one saving grace. Is <laughs> the, uh, the flight is a little longer on no, the way we're, back. No, we're though. kidding. And I always yeah. love coming home. I always do love coming home, but mm. I love going to France. So. Sure, of course. Um, anyway, so for jet lag, if you have a patient who's planning a trip and suffers immeasurably from jet lag, uh, there are a few recommendations they say. They say that melatonin given up to three days before the trip might help. Uh, moderate evidence I tried, at best. didn't help me at all. Yeah. Benzodiazepines do help with the sleep, the insomnia, but as we all know, jet lag is two things. It's the insomnia at night and then the really problematic part, the somnolence and the hyper, you know, the, the, the funk, worse. the funk in the, in, during yeah, the day worse, and I it think. makes that worse. So you got to pick your poison, which if, if insomnia is the part that really kills you, then benzodiazepines may be uh, an effective treatment. What but about the shift it's, work? Yeah. Oh, same, and caffeine. Mostly the same stuff, right? Yeah, mostly the same. Mostly the same stuff. I just say that for the shift work, they say try to expose yourself to bright lights. Um, and I while will, you're awake. I, I will, not yeah. while you're asleep. <laughs> I, and I will not tell you what part of yourself to expose, but bright lights um, during shift works uh, for as much, you know, as much as you can, basically six hours. Don't you know, sleep in the sit in the call room trying to do so work. You don't want to be an on call radiologist. That's right. That, you, then you're going to be very sleepy. And then on your way home or whenever you can, try to darken your world. So sunglasses to try to promote that. The other thing that they suggest, and this is probably the the best thing for when I was you know a resident and then uh, working in emergency departments and such like that. Uh, 
that I found was effective um, is to make sure that you keep your, this is, they all talk about this, the sleep hygiene, your, your bedroom sanctuary. If you're someone who has an irregular sleep schedule, you need to, your bedroom needs in your mind to be associated with nothing but sleep. So no TVs, all of that stuff. They even, they say you can read, I guess this, this article didn't, but others do. But basically when you get into your bed, make sure it's dark, make sure it's cool and that your body associates it with sleep. And that will help a lot. Just stop working shifts. That's, you know. Yeah, yeah. We stop working all the, all, all the way around. <laughs> no, no. That's not the question. Oh, wait. No, I'm saying. Um, um, okay. 26, and in fact, the next few articles are about methodology. So those of you who are not interested, you should be forewarned. Uh, 26, but they're all good articles. 26 is about observer bias in randomized trials. This is by Hjolbertsen from uh, Denmark. It's from the BMJ. Identified uh, 21 trials with more than 4,000 patients where an, uh, the effect of some intervention was assessed both by a blinded observer and by a non-blinded observer. And the the quick and dirty is that the non-blinded observer rated the effect of the intervention about 35% higher. Right, so the, the wound healed better when they were unblind. The more subjective the outcome, the bigger the effect was. It was almost 50% if it was a totally subjective outcome, like are they functioning well? Right. If you were measuring something like the size of the wound, it was still way over, but at least if you were, um, at least if it was an objective measurement, it was a little better. For the more subjective the measurement, the worse it was. And so this is important to know when you read about open label trials, um, you lose the placebo effect. There's a tremendous placebo, not just of the patient, but of the observer. So when the observer knows that you got the right treatment, they overvalue the effect of that treatment. By a lot. Yeah. Well, I thought there was a couple of interesting things on this. One is that the observers actually overvalued both, which was kind of interesting. They overvalued the placebo and the treatment, but, but they over overvalued the way one, di differentially. Yeah, so way there's more. there's this this sort of weird thing that's going on. And the other thing that was really interesting here is that you think, oh, you know, it was a ten thousand person trial or whatever. You know, it probably washes itself out or something. No, not the case. They found in their careful analysis of the data that even a s very small proportion of misclassification, uh, so the, you say the, on the subjective outcome that it's better versus worse, if that is only off by about 2%, so really small numbers, all the it's statistics every, change. all the statistics change. So, so it's really kind of interesting, and it shows that you know, no, you've got to be very careful. Obviously, if you have a 100-person trial, two patients is 2%. If you have a 10,000-person trial, right. it, you need 200 patients for it right. to be 2%, but it's a small percentage it's a really makes a huge difference. Yeah, a small percent makes a big difference in these trials, and you've, you know, it washes away any statistical significance. So again, the, the big thing is that when you see something where the observer who's marking the score is not blinded, that has an enormous effect. Now, there are other huge effects of non-blind trials on the subject the themselves, subject. on the other um, interventions that are used by the experimenter. I know I'm giving them the drug uh, that I think is good. So This I'm is gonna... just the observer this piece. Is just and the that observer. accounts for a third of the, the treatment effect. And, and where it's objective, a half. Twenty-seven is yours. This is endpoint selection and uh, relative versus absolute risk reporting in published medication trials. This is by uh, Mike Hockman, a friend of mine, uh, who's actually faculty at USC, but uh, was a Robert was Wood a John Robert, Robert Johnson, Robert Wood Johnson fellow at, at UCLA and internist. So this is a fairly straightforward article. Um, they went; th these authors went ahead and looked at the six major medical journals looking at medication trials in the past two years. so Every single one of the every trials, single one. So they found 316 trials in JAMA, New England Journal, General Internal Medicine, et cetera, the big, big things with the, uh, medication trials, and they looked at what kind of outcomes the, they reported on. What was their primary outcome? Was that a, a clinical outcome, or was it a surrogate outcome? Right. So, so or a it, disease it, oriented. Did your outcome. diabetes? Did your sugar Hemoglobin change, go down? Or did your A1C, or A1C change? Sorry. Yeah. Or did you have less heart attacks? Right. Or did you drop dead? Uh, so the, a surrogate would be a hemoglobin A1C marker. Or did or they have homocysteine? So we know, for example, that homocysteine is higher in disease, and so if you give folate, you can fix the homocysteine, but you don't fix the strokes. Right. So patient. Focus oriented. on the homocysteine then. Yeah. So it's much easier to focus on these markers. They're easier to measure, and they're easier to 
to fix, but that doesn't mean that you actually mm. fix what the right. patient knows, the patient-oriented outcome. I, I need dialysis, I, you know, as opposed to my creatinine went up 0.2. Right. So surrogate outcomes, as a general rule, are not good, especially when one is trying to decide whether or not to use the thing for treatment. It might be okay in exploratory studies, but if you're going to say this is you know, something I would give to a human, you should have a human outcome. <laughs> right. So there are there are a few surrogate markers where we know that they're fixing them does have an effect on your outcome. So, for example, fixing blood, blood pressure, pressure has some effect on outcome, but we, there are many more where we know they don't have an effect, like hemoglobin. fixing your hemoglobin A1C or your homocysteine or many, many right. other things, your lipids. Right. So, um, so anyway, that's the surrogate. The other one that they looked at is composite outcomes. So this is often clinical outcomes, but you lump three or four of them in together. And some we, of which are really important, like, like death, death <laughs> massive MI, CHF, and then you know recurrent right. angina or something like that, which is very cla- those are that's a very typical composite outcome. So your intervention affects the one that's not very important and that's very subjective, like did you get a vascularization. But it doesn't affect any answer, of the yeah. things that matter, but you report it affected death and MI and stroke and those. Right. It didn't really affect all of them, but it affected Right. The so the, the, the abstract reads there's a 20% reduction in the composite endpoint of more death, right. MI, okay. etc. So composites are bad. Da, 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 and, and disease-specific mortality they looked into. Really important so that, for example, the – the big studies of prostate cancer screening, right. where one of them showed no effect at all. The other said, wait, wait a second, there is an effect, it's a very small one, on prostate right. cancer-specific mortality, but no effect on overall mortality. Right. Does it so really you get to, to die of patient? something else. You're dead, yeah. but but you feel better because it wasn't prostate it cancer. Wasn't pr- well, if you had your prostate hacked out and stuff, you'd probably feel better that you didn't die of prostate cancer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then lastly, relative risk, uh, which is, you know, instead of the absolute risk reduction, 10% lived in Group A and two percent lived in Group B. They give a relative risk, which is you know four hundred percent more people lived. Well, a good example is so you go from two percent to one percent, fifty percent relative risk. But it means that you have to treat a hundred patients for one to benefit. Because right, and they looked at, at how often the abstract only reported relative risk, which is, you know, like I said, you cannot figure out the absolute risk. And for, for that. all of these, what did they find? Way too much. In the this is modern. Big journals, 2008 to 2010, they found that over a third of the time it was a surrogate endpoint. Um, over a third of the time it was a composite endpoint. Uh, when they did mortality, it was very often disease-specific mortality, more than a quarter of the time. More than, more than of the time. And 40, a whopping 44%, almost 50% of the time, um, they reported only the relative risk in the abstract, which, as we know, is what we dominantly read. So, again, if you go from 2% to 1%, it's the same relative benefit as if you go from 50 to 25%. Yeah. But the first one, you need to treat 100 patients for one to benefit. The second, you need to treat four patients for one to benefit. The second one's much more important, but it doesn't sound any better when you put it in relative terms. Yeah. And it's really, um, you know, it's a bit of an indictment on these journal editors and such that in, in t- 2010, this is still happening. And it's way worse in the less. Right. These terms. are the best. This is the best, you know, we've got. Yeah. And um, and it used to be worse than this either. Sure. But anyway. I mean, yeah, there's progress, but slow. slow. <laughs> yeah. Number 28, the last of the methodologic papers is about rethinking credible evidence synthesis. This is a scary paper in the BMJ by Doshi. It's about the use of oseltamivir in um, influenza. Does it, what kind of effect does it really have? And is it to help with hospitalization and severe disease, etc.? And so these are guys who are trying to do a Cochrane review. They did one before and they're trying to update it. These are smart people too. And they became aware that there was all sorts of information that was available to the drug agencies, particularly the equivalent of the FDA in Australia, the Medicines Authority, or I forget what the name of it is, um, which got all this information that isn't published anywhere. It's not published in the medical literature. It's not available on websites. It, 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 the agency had it. The and FDA, it's the real granular data of like the individual the, patients, what happened. And the FDA also has, they were able to get the data from the um, from the Australian agency, but not from the FDA. Keeps promising them, but so far has been stonewalling it. And so what did they find? First of all, they found that 60% of the actual patient data has never been published anywhere. Mm-hmm. That's only that's not counting whatever the FDA isn't telling them about. Sixty percent is not available. If you're the doctor and you want to know does it work or not, you 
we're missing more than half the data. Oh, what do you think that data is likely to show? Is it going to be similar to the data that's available? No, it's much less impressive. So in fact, when they went and found all this data and looked at it, they found that everything changed. How fast you got better with old South Tower Much less with all the data than with the published data. Did it decrease hospitalization? Yes, in the published data. No, in the overall data. Adverse events, much more underreporting. Not surprising. The worst part of this. So a lot of it isn't available. Even if you're the ones who are the experts in it doing a Cochrane review, it's really hard to get it. They had to work really hard to get the data. And then when they got the data, it was 7 million pages worth of data. It was literally 31,000 pages. So when they actually tried to go through it, they said in order to come up with what they're telling us now, it took two full-time people working full-time for 14 months to be able to do this review of one topic for one drug. Mm -hmm. So they suggest that the, A, the reliance on the published data is crazy. It's not useful. It, it's not telling the truth. And B, the system is broken. Not only is there not data available, but it's impossible for any human being to go through it. Yeah, they're proposing a watch, a whole new sort of oversight if group, we, a watchdog group. If we that really you know. want to know what the truth is about new drugs, you need to have somebody whose job it is to take all the data that's submitted mm -hmm. and go through it and, this, and tell us what the truth is. This mm -hmm. is scary because... What do you do about this? Right, and they're saying we have no expertise to do it too. We don't even. I mean, there was a, a big thread in this paper of we don't really know how to go through this kind of data. You know, I mean, because it is really this. You know, it's a really different kind of process, and it was it was scary. Yeah. So um, it, it's try and not surprisingly, the hidden data is not as good as the as the published right. data, and not surprising. Just remember that this is what was submitted to the agency. Who knows what is not submitted to the agency? You know, if you don't want to apply for a certain thing, you know, you do the study for condition A and you want approval for condition A, you you, you submit that. You do a different study for condition B and it doesn't look so good, you, you decide pass. not to, you, you don't pay. You well, pass. and the FDA does have the subpoena ability, but the, you, they, I, but and, the you know, and I don't pretend to know all this, but they, that's only if they subpoena it. They well, don't have to. Well, but even more than that, the mm -hmm. FDA has publicly said to Jeannie Lenzer in the past that um, there are certain things that they won't release because it's considered trade secrets. Yeah, of course. So they course. know about They're... some bad effect, but they don't even tell you. Right. No, I mean, there's a lot of intellectual property rules that uh, this is a really complicated mess that these guys are opening up. But, you know, probably important wow. one. Wow. 29, a big-time paper from big-time people. Speaking of big-time messes, yeah, uh, this is called Diagnosis and Management of Isolated Subsegmental Pulmonary Embolism, Review and Assessment of the Options. This is in Clinical Applied Thrombosis and Hemostasis. It's by Dr. Stein, um, who is famous for being the architect of the two, uh, three pyoped studies. Um, so Mr. P.E., if you will. And, and and Mr. P. Uh, a is sub B is uh, Russell Hall. Russell Hall, yeah, and he's the other author in this. Thing. Right, so and, and there are there are three or four others, so yeah. I don't mean but, to discount no, Dr. Goodman, Dalen, and Mata. But this is yeah. his, this Big is time. his royalty as you can get in the PE world, and so essentially this is a thought piece. It's not it's not laden with primary data. There is some review, but essentially what Dr. Stein is saying is that with the advent of multi detector CTs. We are detecting more and more of less uh, and less of less and less. So these segmental, subsegmental, and then incidental PEs, PEs that are being found on CT scans that were done for trauma, that were done for screening of lung cancer, or God knows what people are doing these days. Um, so what to do in that in that climate where the technology is now seeing clots that are probably intended to be there that is probably our evolutionary biology is such that these these blood clots are supposed to be filtered out via our lung so that we don't have a stroke so that you know and we see the consequences when people have patent foraminal valley so they sometimes get strokes so this is what you know the what to do in this context. And he notes many, many, many things. Um, he notes that small PEs have been common for a long time. We've known about them. We've never known the real significance of them. Um, he notes that it doesn't appear to contribute to chronic um, pulmonary hypertension. Sorry, we're closing the door. <laughs> um, he notes that 
incidental PEs are found in about 1% to 3% of all scans, so big problem, and that there have been a few little trials of people who have not been treated for these tiny PEs, and there have been no untoward events. However, this is like a, t a, whole, a total of 100 people thus far. And one thing so, they don't mention, but we should mention, is that we've done papers recently about, is about overdiagnosis of PE, that we're diagnosing lots, lots more with right. no effect on any measurable outcome, right. suggesting that at least a lot of, if not 90% or more, of the Ps that we're currently diagnosing with modern CT scanners really are overdiagnosis. That right. is, if the we never found them... The population mortality is the same. Exactly. The case mortality is going down. Right. It um, used to be 20% of Ps killed you. Now it's 0.4%. Yeah, it's tiny. It's not because we have better treatment. We have the same treatment. It's because we're diagnosing things that we never diagnosed before but are not killing anybody. Right. And so, you know, what's and then, of course, the, the flip side of it is that warfarin to cause you to bleed to death doesn't care whether you have a PE or not. Right. Right. <laughs> it causes bleeding independent of your PE status. Right. So 7% of people on Coumadin, approximately, that's about usual number, three to you know, five to seven percent, will have a bleeding event every year. You know, so there's definite harms. There appear to be vanishingly small returns for these isolated PEs. We don't know which ones are which, though, which right. is the unfortunate part. We also know that some that usually, if you've survived this PE, we have to worry about the next one. So even right. if this one was small, doesn't mean you're not going to. You have a big right. clot in your leg. You might have the next one. Might be a big one. And we know that clots in the legs are imperfectly seen on ultrasound. So it gets really, really complicated. But this is basically, for me, this was a sort of, a, a, this is a really important paper because it called, it brought to the forefront this idea of overdiagnosis and our need to deal with it. Now, they make some proposals that are not really heavily li literature-based. They say that you may not need to treat somebody who has, at, who's, you know, hemodynamically good, they're healthy, et cetera. They don't have evidence of a DVT. Um, they don't have lung cancer are a continuing risk factor, they don't have AFib, and you can do serial leg exams or follow them. So th there's no evidence to that, but I actually appreciate that they threw that out there. When because you have it's the, saying to the rest of us that if you do that, you have a, a Some protection. Yeah, some, some you know, school of thought that would say that... Um, I don't think we know the answer yet. And I no, hope I, we'll, that, I, I hope think we'll that's learn clear. it better. I also think this is going to get worse because we're going to get better and better scanners and we're going to find peas in everybody. No. And the problem is we don't know which is which. But that's not good enough to say, well, I don't know, so I have to treat. Maybe we do, but or or maybe we have to follow their advice. I don't, but, yeah. but if we're going to end up doing harm to lots of people, because when we start diagnosing trivial things and treating everybody, we are going to do more harm than good. That's not good. This is, the, this is only going to get worse as technology gets better. So this is going to be a big issue in the next 15 years, and we're going to have to – figure out a way to deal with it. For the moment, I think the biggest thing is not go looking for something you don't want to find. Of course, of That's course. That's really, really important. And that has big implications for CT screening. The, the more you lower the threshold for doing it, and it's only natural we lower it because I got a CT on somebody I thought they well, didn't have it. Well, it's self-fulfilling. And, yeah. and there it is, so I better do CTs on everybody. I, I never would have thought that. All of my training had said this person wouldn't have had it, and lo and behold, there it is. At the moment, I think <laughs> it's reasonable to say... You should only worry about and treat a, C, a PE that you were really looking for. Mm -hmm. I if I was worried about a PE, and even if it's a small one, I found it, yeah. But if, on the other hand, oh, wait a second, I, I, this isn't a PE. Um, you know, maybe you'll do. And more again, and it's impossible situation when you get one of these things and they say there's a clot and, you know, then what you ask you the guy and he said, yeah, I had some pain, a few, you know, it's impossible situation, but I do appreciate Dr. Stein, who's basically synonymous with diagnosing PE now saying, Hey, 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 it's not, all I've pushed it too far. I, per, you know, we've pushed it too far and getting in the mix. in. so I do appreciate that. Thank you. Number 30 is all in the title, Informed Decision-Making Trumps Informed Consent. This is by Brink uh, from Yale in Radiology. And this goes along with what we were talking mm -hmm. about before, uh, about instead of making guidelines teach people, this says that most medical decisions the patient should be involved in. It shouldn't be a matter of, here's what you need to do and here's what I need to tell you so that you will agree to do it. It should be, Here's what the options are, and you. here's what you need to know so you can decide or that we together can decide for you. And uh, shared decision makes something we talk about a lot. I think it's really, really important. I think we do it much too little in medicine. Mm -hmm. We do it particularly too little in 
acute medicine, but we also do it too little in chronic medicine with things like it's time for your colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. How about, well, here are some advantages to doing a colonoscopy, but you need to screen how many people to have one less and how many harm will you do if you did that? Mm -hmm. And then it's up to you to decide which would I, am I willing to do that? Um, that's true for mammography, it's true for a lot, PSA, it's true for a lot of things. It's true for, um, should I do a treadmill test on a low risk um, uh, chest pain? Well, that's where it's, it's particularly it's true. You know? So f there are so many places where we shouldn't be talking about, just like we shouldn't be writing guidelines, we should be writing, here's what people need to know in order to make an informed decision. We should be doing that with our patients. And I, I it's a really nice essay and I'm think it's great. Yeah, and I, I would agree. And I think the more that we can get, you know, and I still have reservations about, you know, whether informed decision making is the panacea towards reduced utilization and improved care. I'm not sure about that. But from an ethical human perspective, that's where we need to be. We need to be in a place where we're creating materials that people can understand. I, I think the reason you're you're concerned is though is is not that we shouldn't do it, but no. rather it's hard to do. Right, really hard to do, and that for sure. No, no, my my concern isn't whether you should do it. It's what how effective it'll be given. It's hard you know, to understand. It's hard to Things talk are to not people. easy to to collapse into simple discussion. On the other hand, you know, it's I plan. I I don't know how long I plan on being on this planet, but I plan on there being a planet for a long time, and so we should probably start this process because who knows? Maybe it takes fifty years, but you know, in the scheme of things that's not that long so you know the, the the excuse the excuse that it's really hard is is pretty feeble yeah <laughs> well that takes us to the end of the 30 articles we get time for a little banter here i have two letters to tell you about um, right. one is uh from mark mcconnell and he talks about uh chan in acta neuro scandinavia uh, which was reviewed by our uh, michigan state team they briefly mentioned that the vast majority, if not all, evidence we have on statins is based not on titrating to target LDL, a surrogate marker like we were talking mm -hmm. about, but rather on using a dose and then seeing what happens. Um, and he thinks that's a really critical point that needs to be made strongly, that the, the reason to, um, to test is not your LDL, to, to treat is not your LDL, and you shouldn't be basing it on just a marker. And he cites a study that we're going to be doing actually next month by Hayward and Crumholtz. It's not a study, but it's an essay about... Um, just give a statin and forget it. Yeah. Give it and forget it. Now, I, I wrote back to Mark that I the only th problem I have with that is we shouldn't just give it. <laughs> we should do it. informed decision-making yeah. because, in fact, a patient has a right to know that even if they're in the highest-risk group, 49 out of 50, as a conservative estimate, will get no benefit. Yeah. And, and it's a daily medication every, with side effects that are becoming are, more and more prominent. Very, very yeah, cognitive issues around statins huge, are going to become. Huge. A, so, so, but if you're going to use it, if the patient decides to use it from informed decision making, then it should be based on what's their risk, and then not based on you don't decide what to do based on what the response is. So, uh, thanks for that, uh, Mark. And then Ken Grower. Um, writes about two um, issues that we discussed recently. Pre-participation EKG in healthy young adults. He agrees sudden death is rare. EKG is, is uh, imperfect as a screen. Most findings are false positive or inconsequential. That said, sudden death does occur, and when it happens, it makes headlines. So what's needed are two key questions. Does the athlete feel dizzy or faint during exercise? That is, do a clinical screen when you get symptoms during exercise-related symptoms, those are much more concerning. And then he suggests that also family history is really important. Yeah. I'm not sure. I uh, I think in the extreme cases where there's family history of sudden death, yes. Yes. But like most, a sibling. People, most people don't have that. So yeah. in the ones where it's positive, it helps. In the ones negative, it, it doesn't. Um, so he also says that if there's an AED on the site, it, it should be available and the staff should know how to use it and... That yeah. seems reasonable. If you're going to have it, you should yeah. know how to use it. But I think that's right. I mean, you know, this is one of these things where listen to the patient and probably the most sinister si symptom would be that when I exercise, I feel faint, you know, despite being, yeah. you know, not an out-of-shape potato or something like right. that, you know, um, or, or that I've actually passed out while And um, then we talked about Cho's article about screening EKG and exercise treadmill test in asymptomatic kids. And um, 
he says he agrees that these are uh, not we shouldn't do them routinely but in in and Ken by the way has has been a, a correspondent a lot and he's uh, his special area he's a family practitioner whose special area is cardiology he's published some books and on EKGs in particular and treadmills etc very interested and tremendously knowledgeable about this so um, again he says in folks uh, more than 35 to 40 the reason to do a treadmill is not to look to find uh, coronary disease, but, but to identify some folks who simply should not be exercising. It can facilitate appropriate exercise prescription, and for selected folks can be a motiv motivational tool. Uh, motivational tools, uh, carotid so like ultrasound. ultrasound. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not so sure about that, um, Ken, but your point is is uh, registered. Yep. And um, that's it. I have, um, uh, I'm not going to ask you more about Paris, but I will say, uh, books. Look, yeah. So I, I want to tell people two novels I've read recently that I can recommend. Um, one is um, The Tattooed Soldier by Hector Tobar. Terrific novel. You should read it. I really good. And the other is a, a, a nice novel I really enjoyed. It, it, it sort of ends without getting anywhere, but I, 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 I did like it. It's beautifully written, really well written. And for people of my generation, it's really perfect because it's about the 60s and the kids of people from the 60s. It's called Somewhere Off the Coast of Maine by Anne Hood. Really pretty good. Nonfiction. Uh, I have in, a nonfiction book. In the Garden of the Beasts. Um, uh, I think I mentioned that last month, but this is about the the Nazi, the, the American ambassador to Nazi Germany during the first year that they were in power before they consolidated power. It's a fascinating story. Uh, and I recently read Wild by Cheryl, Cheryl Strayed, who's a new author. She's not, she's not new to the world, but uh, this is like her first book, apparently, and it's absolutely great. It's a, a memoir, and she's only 40-something years old, but she had a terrible tragedy happen in her mid-20s and went on the Pacific Crest Trail for three months and sort of had this sort of cleansing experience. It's absolutely beautifully written, really interesting. It's great for hikers, for people who are, you know, interested in memoirs. For couch potatoes, creates great imagery of the Pacific Crest Trail, which is, you know, an amazing, amazing read. trail uh, that I've been on parts of. <laughs> she went on all thousand miles of it, so it's a little bit different. But uh, highly recommend, easy read to 400 pages of page turning. Well, thank you, Michael, for uh, thank filling you in for at having the last me. moment, and this was really a, a pleasure. And uh, we'll do it again sometime. All right, thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you.